folks, thanks for your patience and sorry for this delayed start, but we are going to start the, um, uh, our meeting, our webinar, our panel on the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, a tipping point in world politics, question mark. The question mark is interesting because we discussed this amongst ourselves and uh, we are quite aware that for many people, the question mark is absolutely not necessary. Uh, certainly, this um, the U.S. withdrawal and the chaotic character of the U.S. withdrawal uh, uh, is, uh, you know, which recalled the uh, U.S. Uh, 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 essentially the U.S. withdrawal from Saigon uh, more than forty years ago. Um, this certainly has been for many people a, a, a tipping point. And it, in many ways, the present situation is much worse than uh, the withdrawal from Vietnam, simply because the withdrawal from Afghanistan caps decades of efforts to try to reverse the Vietnam syndrome. And it clearly shows, it seems to me, that the US's options are narrowing quite radically. Uh, there are many who argue that essentially a very key reason for the U.S. withdrawal has been that the U.S. no longer has the fiscal room to conduct such expensive wars, to continue conducting its expensive wars, that this fiscal room is further narrowed by the fact that the United States now need, has already spent and needs to spend much more on uh, 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 writing its tanking economy. Uh, further, of course, there is the fact that the United States occupation of this country over 20 years could disappear so quickly, the government that it supported could collapse so quickly, the army that it funded and allegedly trained could simply disappear so quickly, etc. And finally, there is the erosion of public support at home, which is happening despite the fact that there is no longer a draft and therefore actually the families and people affected by uh, uh, the lives lost in Afghanistan, etc., is actually relatively small circle compared to the situation as it was in the 1970s. So this erosion of public support has also made it mandatory. And of course, the manner in which the US has had to withdraw, uh, and as I say, it's narrowing options is also leading to the loss of allies. You, the allies were already bewildered by the US, United States rapid withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan. And of course, today we see uh, further news about the new, um, the, uh, just a second, yeah. Further news about the new uh, 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 military pact with the United Kingdom and Australia, which is creating further problems among allies, which France going apoplectic. So really, what is the significance of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan for the United States itself, naturally for Afghanistan, for all the other major countries in the region that are that have a stake in it in some sense or another. And so what we have tried to create a panel which tries to give us as much of a kind of 360 degree view of the situation as possible. So so we will uh, uh, we will uh, go straight to the panel. Our first speaker is uh, uh, is Asadullah Keshtman. Uh, Asadullah Keshtman was born in 1949 in a, in a, a family of humble background in Kabul province. He completed his secondary schooling in Afghanistan and attended university in France, where he completed his uh, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. While he was in France, he joined the French Communist Party. He was elected the, uh, later elected uh, to the Central Committee of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA, and was the first editor-in-chief of the Hakikat -e Inkalab, a Saur newspaper, which was a government organ of the PDPA in 1980. He also served for several years as deputy head of the International Relations Bureau of the Central Committee of the PDPA, and in the final five years of that government, Mr. Keshtman served as ambassador to the Democratic Republic, uh, uh, ambassador, sorry, of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan to Hungary, to Iran, and to Ethiopia. He currently lives in London. Uh, the U.S. defeat in Afghanistan is a moral defeat. Before we get into the heart of the subject, uh, the defeat of the US in Afghanistan, let's try to find out the ins and outs of this defeat. Was what happened in Afghanistan a real defeat in the true sense of the word? Was it really a defeat if the US failed to clean up 
what they call the terrorist based in Afghanistan. I have to say at the outset that I believe that the US has not lost in Afghanistan, but they just completely changed their policy. The US policy is not based on the war against the Taliban or, as they claim, against terrorism, but it pursues more important objectives than a war with the Taliban without discipline or without any agenda. When one speaks of the US military defeat, one naturally imagines scenes of battle. The truth on the ground shows that during the 20 years of the US military presence in Afghanistan, no battle, no real conflict was engaged against the Taliban, except for the blitzkrieg that ended the Taliban rule. These two powers were in great imbalance. On the one hand, the army of a superpower, highly operational and constantly ready for military action, equipped with the most advanced and sophisticated weapons, and on the other hand, scattered groups without any modern military and political organization and without external support. It was unimaginable that these two armies could even confront each other. If we take a look at the circumstances that led to the invasion of Afghanistan under the pretext of fighting terrorism, and the assassination of Osama bin Laden, we can conclude that the purpose of the occupation of Afghanistan was the control of its strategic location. There is no logical reason for the invention of Afghanistan The core of terrorism responsible for 9-11 was elsewhere, not in Afghanistan. To justify its military presence in Afghanistan after the fall of uh, Taliban in 2001, the US tolerated the activities of scattered Taliban groups and a controlled war against the US-led Afghan government. And at the same time, the US silently and quietly advanced its plans to expand its influence in Central Asia in a complicated and ambiguous policy. Many observers now believe that after these essentially secret preliminaries, the US is preparing the next stage of its plan. This new phase would include the gradual and calculated introduction of disorder and chaos in Central Asia and in the uh, Xinjiang province in China by provoking unrest and border wars. All the foundations of this plan were already ready and in place in the north and the northeast of Afghanistan. The violent and fundamentalist, the violent, belligerent and fundamentalist Daesh warriors have been transferred from Syria and Iraq into Afghanistan. The information about their transfer to Afghanistan has been revealed for several years and increasingly by the media in the region and the Russian representatives to the United Nations. Hamid Karzai also denounced the arrival of unknown individuals transported by American helicopters in northern Afghanistan near the Central Asia region. These Daesh fighters are mainly Chechen, Tajik, Uzbek, from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uyghur and other Caucasian people who are preparing an attack on Central Asia. The people of Afghanistan are threatened by great dangers. And it is feared that Afghanistan will become the spearhead of aggression against our neighbors in Central Asia and the scene of a bloody war. All indicators point 
to the fact that the US plans are moving into the direction of creating unrest in Central Asia. The countries of Central Asia, China and Iran are in a state of maximum anxiety and have undertaken preventive actions in the diplomatic and operational fields. In the opinion of almost all political observers in Afghanistan, the events of the last two months reveal that the long-term plan of the United States first staged the Taliban as a political force in the framework of the Qatar diplomatic negotiations and then paved the way for the group to take power. This plan is justified by Afghanistan's strategic importance in Southwest Asia and in the Central Asian neighborhood. The United States easily invited Afghanistan after the breakup of the Soviet Union and before the rebirth and assertion of Russia on the international scene. And it had enough time and means to develop new plans plans that were inconceivable in the past. The main goal of the strategy is to establish foothold in Central Asia and Afghanistan became a key part of this plan. The other parts of this plan seek to impact Iran and China. All these objectives became possible with the occupation of Afghanistan. 20 years were enough for the Americans to prepare the Taliban's medieval fundamentalist rebel groups to become an effective tool for the implementation of their plans. It should not be forgotten that in the fight against Russia, Iran and China, the, econ the economic and political revival of the United States so the United States uh, want to change the future uh, of uh, the people in that uh, region uh, and they want to find a religious fundamentalist base. And they want to follow the model of uh, Saudi Arabia. Afghanistan will become the export center of religious terrorism and the Brzezinski cherished doctrine of using a special form of political Islam will be worked out. Considering this new situation, I think it's likely that this plan will not succeed. It will, of course, depend heavily on the unpredictable nature of the Taliban's attitude. The Taliban is a movement without a program or organization, and its supporters are mainly illiterate uh, and uh, prone to political, social and cultural retardation. The Taliban's internal differences and the existence of various groups with different interpretations of the Islamic Sharia and the transformation in their political vision make the realization of this plan very difficult. Although the first steps of the Taliban after taking power, guided by their masters, were less tense than before, they very soon gave way to violence and brutality. The main reason is that the Taliban masses are gradually entering the scene and the contradiction between the backward vision of the Taliban is confronting the population in its society, administration and everyday life. The small group of Taliban elites who made a relative successful show in the early days of their takeover of power in accepting uh, others uh, are now being overwhelmed by the torrent of Taliban coming down from the mountains and villages uh, that have only no misery, war and resentment. The population is faced with the typical behavior of the Taliban as they already knew and no longer with the democracy of the first days after their takeover. In conclusion, it can be said that the return of the Taliban to power is a great moral defeat for the US. At this point, it can be said that the US has lost in Afghanistan. This 
is the most stinging defeat known to an omnipotent superpower. The people of the world are witness of this truth. The United States, which invaded Afghanistan with the promise of building a, dem a democratic and advanced Afghanistan, have abandoned the Afghan people, leaving them in misery. By putting the Taliban in power, the Americans have committed a historic injustice and horror against the people of Afghanistan and modern civilized humanity as a whole. The women of our country who were trying to emancipate themselves gradually are once again trapped in the evil circle of persecution and atrocious oppression. Our people are under the yoke of the Taliban's dictatorship, political, social and cultural injustice, which, oppress which oppresses other religions, thoughts, ethnies and tribes other than their own. The Americans have shown the world that for them, moral principles have no value at all, and that their ferocious interests come first at all levels everywhere. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Keshtman, um, for uh, your very uh, important observations. It's very critically important that we have somebody from Afghanistan uh, on our panel. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Oleg Barabanov. Um, Oleg is um, a Russian historian and political scientist, and he's a program director at the Valda International Discussion Club and a professor of the famous uh, Gimo University in Moscow. So Oleg, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Radhika. Um, uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, the International Manifesto Group for inviting me uh, to speak at uh, this conference. And uh, uh, sure, uh, for Russia, uh, the uh, Afghan events are uh, quite important. Uh, first of all, they are important historically uh, because of uh, the well-known history of the Russian presence in uh, Afghanistan uh, and uh, the Russian war in Afghanistan and uh, the withdrawal of Russian uh, armed forces from Afghanistan in 1989. And uh, now, uh, sure that everybody uh, compare uh, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, with Saigon, with uh, Vietnam events. But we in Russia uh, compare two withdrawals, uh, the Soviet withdrawal in uh, 1989 and the American withdrawal now. And uh, uh, as far as I can see in the Russian television and the Russian state media, there is a, a quite open uh, feeling of revenge that now uh, the Americans um, have lost uh, in Afghanistan too and have, uh, have lost more uh, terribly, more catastrophically than uh, the Russians, than the Soviets did it uh, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so, and this feeling of revenge is uh, quite uh, important for uh, uh, the Russian public opinion, because uh, today uh, we have the parliamentary elections in Russia, and uh, during the electoral campaign in these weeks, uh, uh, this uh, Afghan news, uh, this uh, idea that uh, the Americans are uh, not better than uh, we were 30 years ago, uh, uh, was used uh, quite uh, strongly for uh, social mobilizations uh, by the ruling party, the United Russia. Uh, during this pre-electoral campaign, and it became a, a real factor of uh, cohesion and uh, social mobilization uh, in the domestic Russian politics now. Uh, another point is um, uh, Russian relations with the Taliban. Uh, uh, sure that uh, the Taliban was uh, officially uh, officially blamed in, in Russia as the terrorist and extremist uh, organization, 
uh, in the Russian newspapers and the Russian media, uh, when you just write uh, the word uh, the Taliban, you must, uh, in parentheses, add uh, uh, the, the terrorist organization, which is um, violating international law and uh, not permitted to act in Russia. Uh, but this is uh, just formalities because uh, already for several years, uh, the Russian authorities, the Russian foreign ministry and uh, other agencies, they had uh, quite, uh, quite fruitful, informal and uh, also a formal, a public dialogue uh, with the Taliban political, political wings. Uh, there were several visits of Taliban delegations in Moscow uh, starting three or four years ago. And so uh, there is a, a kind of uh, dialogue, a, a real working dialogue between uh, Russia and Taliban. And uh, uh, when uh, th this summer, when uh, the Taliban started their um, uh, military campaign, their military advance in the northern Afghanistan just before the fall of Kabul, uh, there were some fears uh, that. Uh, the conflict could uh, spill over to the post-Soviet Central Asia, to Tajikistan, to Uzbekistan, and, and so on. But uh, as far as I can see uh, uh, from the logic of this uh, Russia-Taliban talks, uh, it was uh, uh, a clear agreement uh, between both parties that the Taliban uh, uh, will not go uh, through the border, that the Taliban will not go to the post-Soviet territory, and uh, uh, at least for now, until now, uh, the Taliban uh, are, they are quite uh, uh, quite faithful to this uh, agreement, and there is no spillover, no problem uh, with relations uh, uh, in Central Asia. So, uh, uh, and if it, if it became a poorly domestic uh, Afghani affair without the spillover to the post-Soviet Central Asia. So it's, uh, it's okay for us. Another point, uh, uh, another plus uh, that uh, we, can see, uh, we could see that nevertheless, that uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, republics in Central Asia, Tajikistan, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, to, to less extent Turkmenistan, uh, they became uh, more dependent uh, uh, to Russia after the Taliban victory because uh, 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 they are quite afraid uh, of this possible spillover and they need uh, much more uh, the Russian military support and the Russian diplomatic support uh, than previously uh, in the time of uh, the pro-American uh, government in uh, Afghanistan. So in that sense, uh, 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 there, there were also quite a positive uh, diplomatic uh, effect uh, for the Russian policy in uh, Central Asia. Uh, the next point is um, uh, if you put uh, uh, the Taliban and Afghanistan uh, in general in the context of uh, Russia-Pakistan relations, uh, uh, because uh, uh, they were historically uh, not quite good, and exactly in the context of the uh, Soviet-Afghan war or in the 80s, uh, the Pakistan uh, was quite clearly from another point of the, uh, from another part, uh, another side of the front. Uh, but now, uh, several years ago, Pakistan, uh, together with India, joined uh, the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, uh, it's a kind of uh, soft power coordination organization. It's not properly the military alliance, but uh, they do some um, MRCOM exercises. They do some anti-terrorist exercises. They do some joint uh, police coordination, uh, something like this. And uh, 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 after that, after Pakistan joining the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, uh, uh, there was a, a real boom uh, in military cooperation between Russia and Pakistan, mainly military, much more than the economic and cultural and uh, other spheres of the cooperation. 
and uh, uh, the Russian and the Pakistani military, uh, they are quite uh, frank to each other. Sure, that's uh, also a kind of uh, diplomatic game. Uh, it was a kind of the response to the uh, Indian rapprochement with the Quad to the United States, to Australia, and so on. Uh, and uh, Russia started to play with Pakistan diplomatically. But uh, uh, we are doing now for five or six years, and uh, relations are quite, uh, quite positive. And uh, there were many bilateral talks between uh, Russia and Pakistan on the Afghani situation and uh, on the Taliban rising. Because um, there is, I don't know if it's true or not, but there is a stereotyped point of view that uh, uh, the Pakistani government uh, was and is behind the Taliban. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, with this uh, Russian-Pakistani dialogue, uh, uh, there were many discussions uh, how to uh, how to cooperate uh, for both countries in the Afghani affairs, and uh, it's possible that there were also some uh, Pakistani uh, support for uh, organizing for promoting Russia Taliban uh, dialogue uh, just uh, a couple of years ago. So in that sense, uh, uh, Russian-Pakistani rapprochement also oh, is in favor of the uh, situation. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I just uh, stop here. Uh, if there will be later any questions, I will answer on them with pleasure. But uh, sure that uh, everybody continue to blame Taliban in Russia as a terrorist organizations, showing the atrocities at the television uh, and so on. But uh, in the shadow politics uh, behind the scene, uh, we could see uh, uh, several uh, positive uh, effects for Russia with Taliban coming to power in Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, Ajamu Baraka, as many of you will know already, is national organizer of the Black Alliance for Peace and was the 2016 candidate for vice president on the Green Party ticket. Um, Ajamu serves on the executive committee of the U.S. Peace Council and the leadership body of the United National Anti-War Coalition or UNAC. He is editor and contributing columnist for the Black Agenda Report and contributing colum columnist in Counterpunch. He was recently awarded the U.S. Peace Memorial 2019 Peace Prize and the Serena Shim Award for Uncompromised Integrity in Journalism. We're very honored to have you, Ajamu. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radhika, and thank uh, everyone um, who, who are involved in this very important conversation this morning. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the specifics around the so-called defeat in Afghanistan. Um, of the U.S., I will say that um, um, in alignment with our first speaker, uh, my assessment is, in fact, that uh, the U.S. did not, in fact, lose in Afghanistan, that it achieved most of its objectives. Uh, but the one element that it did not achieve was uh, what I believe to be their main objective, which was to uh, have a permanent presence, physical presence uh, in the country. Uh, as part of the efforts to uh, not only destabilize uh, Central Asia, but also to uh, block the uh, Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative once that became clear that that was going to be a real threat to them. Um, and even that decision was made a little late because it was quite clear from around 2007, uh, looking at uh, the internal conversations within the U.S., uh, there was, that uh, it was acknowledged that uh, there was no military uh, reality that uh, could ensure the complete and total control of the country uh, by the U.S. Uh, that, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, a, a definition of military success uh, was, in fact, impossible. But yet the U.S. remained uh, because of its greater uh, global uh, strategic objectives. 
But what I want to touch on is just very briefly the last few months of the of the uh, Taliban drama uh, in Afghanistan. But then more importantly, to talk quickly about what does all this mean for those of us who are opposed to uh, global militar militarization, uh, opposed to uh, warmongering, uh, opposed to uh, to imperialism. What might this mean for us? So very quickly, one of the things that struck us in the Black Alliance for Peace uh, was the disarray among the rulers in the US around uh, how to proceed uh, with Afghanistan. There, of course, were hardcore elements that wanted to uh, maintain some kind of presence inside the country. Uh, there were some other elements that uh, were committed to what was in fact a redeployment of US assets uh, from Afghanistan uh, to complete uh, the pivot to Asia. And it seems that within these various struggles that uh, those elements that recognize that uh, Afghanistan uh, was now becoming a drain, uh, that they had uh, plundered as much as they could from the area uh, and that uh, in fact, it was uh, to their advantage uh, to uh, at least attempt to try to maintain some kind of Afghan government, uh, but allow for the Taliban to, to be unleashed, if you will. Uh, that kind of destabilization, of course, always plays into the uh, longer term strategic objectives of US imperialism. So and, and when you look at the, at the, at the process, of conversations between uh, uh, US authorities and the uh, Taliban and the Afghan government just in the last 18 months, um, beginning with uh, the communications that were taking place between then uh, candidate uh, Joe Biden with um, uh, members of the Afghan government. Um, you, we, we looked at um, communications beginning like in July of 2019, where they were giving mixed messages to the Afghan government. Uh, they were suggesting that there would be an enduring uh, relationship between the U.S. Uh, and Afghan, the Afghan government. Um, and even after the Doha agreement in February 2020, those assurances continued. Uh, when the uh, now a Democrat nominee, Joe Biden, uh, was articulating efforts or articulating positions uh, uh, on Afghanistan, they, he indicated quite clearly that uh, there was concerns with the Doha agreement. Uh, there were signals that uh, were suggesting that uh, the Biden um, uh, campaign was suggesting to the Afghan authorities that if he won the election, uh, that the Doha agreement would be seriously uh, reevaluated. So there was efforts to give the impression that they were going to continue in Afghanistan. Uh, once uh, Biden, of course, won the election, uh, there was a few months of complete and utter confusion, it appears, on the surface. But internally, it's, it's, it's quite obvious that, uh, that that debate within foreign policy circles continued. Uh, and what was happening was that those elements that believe that it was more important to make the shift um, and to allow the Afghan government to attempt to try to uh, survive, uh, they had basically won out. Um, for, so for the first couple of months of the Biden administration, uh, there was uh, no firm commitment uh, on the part of that administration to the Afghan government. And in fact, when you look at uh, what was communicated uh, as late as June, uh, both in public and private, it's very obvious that uh, the intelligence of the U.S. Uh, understood that uh, once the uh, U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, uh, that the Afghan government was in fact in trouble. And the most optimistic uh, estimations was that it would uh, collapse in six months. Uh, but that, that uh, intelligence report that came out on June 23rd was countered by public uh, statements that were made by General Austin and others on June 25th and in conversations with the Afghan government uh, in which it was suggested that uh, the Afghan government was, was uh, in, in place uh, and that it was going to survive. 
Um, so, you know, this these contradictions are are, are important uh, because in all of the conversations between the U.S. and Afghan um, authorities, no, in no, in any of these conversations was any mention of what might happen uh, once the Afghan government fell and all of the personnel that were in the country that had been working with the uh, U.S. for for years. Um, so what we have is basically a, a situation that is not so much as tragic as what we saw in Vietnam, but a situation that was developed as a consequence of the changing uh, internal uh, issues within the U.S. government, uh, it is, its inability to uh, rule in the same way uh, that sharpened those contradictions among the authorities in terms of how to try to uh, maintain U.S. hegemony uh, both in Central Asia and really uh, globally. So Afghan, the Afghanistan situation was lost. Everybody understood that. Um, the question now becomes, what does it mean for us? In my last couple of minutes, let me just talk about that. That basically, it seems to us that there are some real possibilities for the anti-war movement. That there are uh, implications ideologically for how we can perceive, uh, proceed. That um, the U.S. public, for example, and I will stay with the U.S. public for a moment because that's my main theater of operation, uh, has basically determined that uh, these endless wars are no longer sustainable, uh, that uh, the, the cost both in lives uh, and in uh, resources uh, are, are no longer being able to be uh, supported. And that provides some real possibilities for us. Um, on the other hand, though, we, we have some strong elements that are suggesting that uh, there were mistakes in Afghanistan that can be corrected, uh, that uh, Afghanistan and other uh, areas in, on, on the planet are areas of concern for the U.S. Um, and, and with its continued sort of framing of the so-called war on terror as an entry point for intervention. Uh, and some of those, uh, some of that messaging is beginning to resonate somewhat. But what we need to do as uh, um, anti-imperialists, as folks who are pro-peace, is to impress upon the publics both in the U.S and in Western Europe, uh, that uh, the, the planet can no longer uh, sustain itself uh, if there's still this continued commitment to global uh, militarization and war, that the publics around the world are really committed to a new kind of uh, dispensational power and a new kind of morality. And we've got to push that. In the US, we want to raise up the issue of the military budget and what that means. We also want to suggest that we need to make peace a, a, a issue in the coming midterm uh, elections. We want to we want to raise the issue of uh, a question, the rationale for full spectrum dominance. Uh, we want to raise the issues of NATO and the U.S. global military structures and bases. And we say we can begin to really aggressively support issues around or, or attempts to try to uh, establish zones of peace in various regions. So we think that we have, that the US and, and, and European uh, 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 militarists are on the defensive. And it's really up to the anti-war community, uh, the anti-imperialist communities uh, to sharpen its messaging, uh, to ground itself in the social movements uh, and to raise these contradictions uh, we believe that we have a, the possibility of a real opening if, in fact, uh, we are able to do that uh, going forward. I am here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ajamu. That's great. I think we will take uh, Nancy Lindisfarne next. Is, is that okay, Nancy? Uh, okay, great. So let me introduce Nancy. Nancy taught anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies for many years. She's the author of Bartered Brides, Politics, Gender and Marriage in Afghan Tribal Society. Um, she's also authored a short story collection, Dancing in Damascus, and is the co-editor of Dislocating Masculinity and of Masculinities Under Neoliberalism. 
Her book with Richard Tapper and um, Afghan Village Voices was published in 2020. She has a blog on gender, class, and Middle Eastern politics. So Nancy, please go ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you and uh, hello all. Um, I'm coming in at a, a, a place in the order which I find rather unexpected. And I wonder if I can't um, sort of both summarize a number of points that have been made already, but also to pick up what Ajamu was just saying, because I found that quite inspiring, quite hopeful. And maybe I'll have something to contribute there. Um, I absolutely agree with the speakers who have said that this is a military victory for the, uh, the Taliban and also a political victory. And I think what hasn't been mentioned so far is that I believe that the Taliban actually won because they had popular support. Nobody can win a guerrilla war anywhere without actually having support on the ground for ordinary people. And this has to be factored into what one's understanding. I think it's very important to understand that this is not because the Afghans necessarily are fanatical Muslims or love the Taliban, but just because the actual American occupation was so horrifically corrupt and very, very violent, very ugly. Um, so those things need to be part of where we might go next, where, where some kind of hope might lie. Um, Another point which was mentioned just in passing is I think it's very important to understand that the war on terror has actually been police. Um, it's been politically defeated in the United States. Um, this is what Trump was offering. He was wanting a withdrawal. Uh, it's an isolationist thing. It was, I mean, he's an unspeakable racist, but there was definitely a support for him withdrawing from the Afghan war. And Biden has picked this up as we've just heard described. And I think that is in itself extremely interesting and part of what we have to factor in here. Um, and I think it comes from, as somebody said much earlier, I mean, or that I think the first speaker was actually talking about the small numbers of Americans um, fighting in what is, after all, a, a non-conscript, a, a politically a professional army. But if you look at the, the actual shape of the people who are being harmed, who are going back for time and time again, other kinds of um, service duties, three and four times into Afghanistan, into Iraq, of course, these people in these communities understand how, how desperate it is and, and so on. So that kind of political shape, I think, is not to be ignored. Um, and it comes with a need to actually reassess the Obama surge and the kind of essential imperial project of the mainstream political establishment that he was um, exact, um, exacting, I suppose. OK, um, I think it is a turning point in world history. This is, after all, a very great military power that was defeated by a small group of desperately poor people wearing sandals when they started out and so forth. And it does, this does weaken the American empire. It does open up or create this utterly new dynamic between a rising financial center in China, the projects of Belt and Rose and so on. So it's, it is a, a very important moment. And from that, I want to come back and say something else about the country itself. As I can understand it, the Taliban took over with almost no bloodshed. So this was something that was set up. It wasn't happening quickly. It was actually set up for a long, long time. Um, my own understanding from m many Afghans that one talks to and knows is that they are genuinely ambitious to rule the country and to rule it um, ecumenically. In other words, one of the things that the new Taliban, the people that came back, not the earlier ones, was that they understood they couldn't be Pashtun chauvinists, that they did actually need to be inclusive to actually bring other ethnic groups in. And this seems to be the case in terms of what's happened in the north, in terms of cities that have fallen and so forth. Um, they're not Pashtun. They have supporters in all of those areas and in Herat, and so on. So we've got a a group of people who are not democratic, of course not, um, who are fundamentalist in very many ways, but who 
have actually wanted to, I think, bring a certain kind of peace um, and have been welcomed for these reasons. And they are also, and this is important and again, not mentioned, they actually have not been corrupt. Um, they've created a kind of judicial system, which many Afghans who don't necessarily care for them at all have gone to because the actual Ghani government and the Karzai government before that were so corrupt and there was no political, you, you couldn't take cases, civil cases, for instance, to the judges within the government system without finding yourself paying great bribes and so forth. So the inequality that wealth, a corrupt judicial system allows, uh, supports, um, is also something that so far the Taliban have managed to avoid. Whether they can go on doing this, God only knows. And this is where um, I think we need to think very wisely about what might happen next. The country is, uh, they, the government is very um, vulnerable financially, as I understand it. The Americans have still locked in whatever wealth funds they have in the Fed. Um, that makes it very difficult for other other agencies, anybody else who wants to actually support um, the Afghan people to actually transfer money into the country. So there is a, a real financial problem. There will be starvation very, very soon because there is another drought that is coming. So this is this drought is, I think, enormously important to in what has happened, but also what should happen. Um, we have, and again, we've heard this, we have the surrounding powers playing a very careful game um, politically uh, because they don't want an enormous number of refugees. Both Iran and Pakistan have been making, making nice with the Taliban. We've heard um, our Russian uh, colleague actually talking about the Central Asian republics and their fear of the Taliban actually coming and inspiring a kind of Muslim revolt. We've understood about China and the Belt and Road and the interests there. It will be very interesting to see whether these countries financially are able to support the Taliban and step in where the Americans have stepped out. And that is important. And we know that there are many aid agencies that are actually trying to do something in the circumstances of very desperate people. And one of the things that is absolutely, sorry, this is the anti-war thing, and this is the trying to make another way of thinking about things. There is climate change. There is a drought in this country. There is a desperation. And if one can imagine an anti-war movement, which actually begins to think in terms of climate, it is possible to actually think of aid agencies, money coming in to make this, in a dream, I suppose, a sort of poster country for how change might happen. J jobs being brought in, green jobs being brought in, climate jobs being brought in, with the idea, quite simply, of finding a way for the Afghans to have a livelihood, to transform their country, to protect themselves against ground, and perhaps to actually manufacture um, wind turbines, solar, solar panels, and so forth, and begin to export them. In other words, think really transformatively. It seems to me that without a couple of visions, without a bit of a dream here, we lose the chance that this real break in the sort of global politics um, can provide us. So there we go. Okay. It's a rant. That's that's great. Thank you, uh, uh, Nancy. Uh, very informative. And okay, so since we've uh, had a few no-shows, we're now going to the, our last speaker, and that's Medea. Medea, is that all right? Can you go now? Can you go now? Yes, I hear some lovely music. Yes, I'm sorry. It's my, um, I'm trying to stay in touch with another speaker who will probably arrive while you are speaking. So you may not be the last speaker. I hope not. So let me introduce Medea. Uh, I, I think she's one of those people about whom you say she needs very little introduction, but I will give one anyway. Medea is the co-founder of Global Exchange and Code Pink Women for Peace, and is the author of a 2018 book, Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Her previous books include Kingdom of the Unjust, 
behind, US, behind the US-Saudi connection, drone warfare killing by remote control, uh, don't be afraid, gringo, a Honduran woman speaks from the heart, and uh, she co-authored with Jody Evans, Stop the War, uh, Stop the Next War Now in 2005. So Medea, please go ahead. Yes, well, thank you so much. This has been a, a wonderful uh, group of speakers so far, and I want to pick up on a couple of things that have been said. Um, I want to look at how the U.S. public has interpreted what happened. And one thing I don't think that the American people understand yet is the depth of destruction that the US has caused. Uh, I was listening to a show on CNN the other day and they had a panel that came to a consensus saying, well, we tried to build things, uh, but the Taliban would come and destroy. We would build bridges and they would blow them up. And you know this narrative, we, we, we tried to be the good guys. Uh, with no discussion about where these tens of thousands of bombs that the U.S. drops landed, uh, very little discussion uh, since the, uh, uh, the Taliban took over about the civilian casualties, what Nancy talked about, uh, why there was support for the Taliban because of the cruelty of the U.S. occupation. Uh, we did a study at Code Pink to look at how many bombs were actually dropped in Afghanistan and came to the number of 46 bombs a day, every day for 20 years. So where did those 46 bombs a day land? Uh, the American people have no idea. It's interesting that the last bombs uh, that were the ones from the drone attack as the US was leaving, uh, where the U.S. military made up a story like they make up stories for the last 20 years that a high level uh, person was, uh, who was about to attack at the airport was blown up with a carload of explosives. And for the rare occasion where the media actually went out and did a thorough investigation, found out that it was indeed a, a family of 10 with uh, their, all their children who had piled into the car um, to greet the father as he came home. Uh, this tragedy is something that we barely see, uh, partly because as Nancy, you said, there is no draft like in the days of Vietnam, very few Americans are actually, uh, have been dying in Afghanistan or even Iraq, uh, but also because the media has done such a miserable job. Most of those airstrikes happen in, not in the middle of the city like this last drone attack, but it's not that difficult to get out to these different places. And I would really say we have to condemn the media for the horrific job they have done by, by covering up for the US and the West in all of these years. Um, but uh, I think now uh, the, the world has seen that America is able now with its military might to only do one thing and that is destroy. You know, it used to be that the US military would come in and kick down the doors for US corporations to come in. That doesn't even happen anymore. They just have a pure destructive force. And now we see that China comes in and does the rebuilding. Uh, it's a very clear dichotomy that the US destroys and China builds and all the propaganda the US put, puts out uh, cannot deny that fact. Uh, and that hurts America tremendously on the international stage. Uh, I think a lot of people can see that America is in a stage of decline, that our economy has become so financialized that we have gutted our military sector except for the ma manufacturing of weapons of destruction. Uh, and the use of economic warfare through these sanctions has really forced other countries to uh, move towards China uh, and look for other sources of not only trade, but other kinds of currency that we will see just growing in the years ahead. Um, there, there has been some talk about the new openings and Nancy, it's uh, Radhika, it's interesting you started out mentioning the Vietnam syndrome. And you know, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, uh, that was the result of the US defeat in Vietnam and the American people saying, wait a minute, we don't wanna get into that kind of war again. 
Uh, and I think we are experiencing something similar right now, which we can call either the 9-11 syndrome or the Afghanistan syndrome, uh, where the American people are scratching their heads and saying what happened in those last 20 years. Um, but there is a disconnect that is so enormous, and that is between what the American people are thinking, because they lost support for these wars in both Afghanistan and Iraq uh, a long time ago, but now even more so. And you would think that a logical conclusion would be, uh, while we have all these real uh, threats uh, facing us of the climate and the pandemic, et cetera, uh, isn't it time to say uh, that the military should be held accountable? And part of that is to cut the military budget. Um, what is happening in Congress, though, is just the opposite. There is an effort now to increase the military budget even more than the Biden administration had asked for, which was even more than we had during the Trump administration. So uh, uh, on the one hand, you have the American public that has heard uh, uh, Biden himself say that we wasted, and I would say it's a lot worse than wasted, uh, $300 million a day for 20 years on this war in Afghanistan, and yet we don't have the uh, corresponding efforts within Congress to cut the budget. Uh, we um, know that while the uh, many of us in the peace movement tried to stop the US from getting into this war in Afghanistan to begin with, we only had one colleague in Congress who was willing to join us, and that was Congresswoman Barbara Lee. She has put forth a bill to cut the Pentagon budget almost in half by $350 billion, which would still leave the US with by far the largest military budget in the world. How many of the other four of the 434 other members of Congress do you think have joined her in that request? Um, four, a total of four. Now there are about a hundred Congress people in the Progressive Caucus. Not even, I think there's only one member of the squad in Ilhan Omar who has joined Barbara Lee in that request. Um, so we have still an extremely strong military industrial congressional caucus despite this devastating uh, fiasco in Afghanistan. We see the profits from the five big weapons companies have soared, in fact, uh, some by over 1,000% in these last 20 years. I managed to get inside the shareholder meeting of one of the big five, and that is General Dynamics, and said to them, if the only way that you can make these uh, obscene profits is by war and destruction and death, don't you think you need a different business model? And the CEO said to me, um, you are wrong. We pray for peace. We work for peace. We want peace. Just the week before, she had told her shareholders that the dangerous uh, world out there actually gave a good cadence for their product. And what she was talking about, of course, was China. Um, which means that we as a peace movement have to focus so much on a campaign that uh, many of you are involved in and we have Code Pink have of China's not our enemy uh, to really stop this massive propaganda campaign now to try to justify uh, this uh, enormous Pentagon budget by the need to confront China. Um, the other... Um, issue that Ajama brought up of the opening we have, I think is actually a tremendous one because you know, Ajama, it's been very hard to build a peace movement in the United States in the last decade, um, precisely because there is not a draft, precisely because the wars have been going on for 20 years and the, me and the media has barely even covered them. Uh, and so our uh, strategy in these last years have been, well, okay, we can't get a lot of people out on the streets, um, but we uh, can support our allies in these other movements that are connected and try to help them make the connections, whether that was the racial justice movement, the Black Lives Matter, uh, the issues around militarization in our communities, the issues around the lack of money for uh, the green jobs uh, or the um, uh, Medicare for all. And uh, we have become very much a part of these movements, but we haven't seen until now uh, the real lifting up 
of the issue of the military budget. And in the last couple of weeks, when I have been going to demonstrations, whether they're about affordable housing or Medicare for all, uh, um, uh, whatever the issue, I hear people saying, if we could spend $300 million a day for 20 years on a fiasco in Afghanistan, we can put that money into supporting people's real needs, into addressing the climate crisis. And so we are there now. And that's why we at Code Pink have launched this campaign to cut the military budget. Um, we are reaching out to these different movements, labor, environment, the faith-based groups, um, uh, the racial justice groups and say, we need to come together. It might not be on the streets, but we need you to be writing open letters to the Biden campaign, to be educating your own constituencies about this. I don't think that we will see a result in our Congress, certainly not this year while the budget is being voted on very soon. We won't see it in the next year. But I think I would say that about five years from now, we will begin to see the fruits of this effort uh, to cut the budget, to invest those resources that have been liberated uh, into the real needs of our community, and to see what would be a nice way to see an end to this empire uh, would be one that doesn't go out in a smoke by blowing up a lot of the world with it, uh, but would gradually move from this uh, idea that militarism is the way to relate to the rest of the world uh, to one in which indeed we use uh, diplomacy and cooperation to relate to the rest of the world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria. Uh, Mohamed Marandi is Professor of North American Studies and Dean of the Faculty of World Studies at the University of Tehran. So, Mohamed, the floor is yours. About seven to ten minutes, please. Oh, thank you for having me. Of course, I'm not the dean anymore. I was dean in the past, so I'm uh, I'm just a, a, a teacher at the University of Tehran. Um, I think that there are a, a number of things that I should point out, although maybe my good friends and colleagues who've spoken before me have covered these issues. So if I'm repeating others, then I, I sincerely apologize. Uh, I was in a meeting before this, so I again, I apologize for my delay. Uh, I think one thing that has to be taken into account is that what we're seeing today in Afghanistan or what we saw in Syria, or in Iraq, the extremism that we call ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda, or even the Taliban, the history of the Taliban. This is a result of US policy itself. The United States, along with its allies, created this menace in the 1980s in Afghanistan. We all know this. But the reason why I'm saying this is that uh, when you create uh, a problem like al-Qaeda, like ISIS, you cannot manage it. It's not something that you can control and use it against your enemies and then have it suddenly disappear. And so, and also a lot of what we see today as Islamophobia, the irony of course, is that it's not a, an ideology, al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Taliban, I, I'll get into a bit later, that is, has been indigenous to this part of the world. It was uh, an, the Wahhabism and uh, was a predominantly uh, a Saudi ideology. It came from Najd, which is a part of Saudi Arabia. And with US support and Western support and NATO support, it grew. And now ordinary Muslims are antagonized for what is basically a creation of the West. And ironically, Western countries, the Western media, they antagonize countries like Iran and attribute things to Iran that are actually part of the ideology of those groups that they created. So the, the terrorism or extremism that they attribute to Iran, which has a civil society, which has elections, which whether the Western countries like uh, Iran or not, uh, is very different from these entities that Western countries help promote. So that's one issue. The second issue is that the United States, ironically, after occupying Afghanistan and Iraq, they contributed 
to the defeat of their own occupation by antagonizing Iran and, and creating sanctions. The United States basically prevented Afghanistan and Iraq from normalizing their economies. So the United States acted against its own interests, whether legitimate or otherwise. We consider the occupation as illegitimate. But in any case, the United States as an occupation force, NATO as an occupation force, their actions towards Iran were self-defeating. The United States not only created extremism, NATO not only created extremism that became a problem, but in their foolish attempt, an illegitimate and brutal attempt to defeat this extremism that they created and by occupying these countries, they defeated their own illegitimate occupation by further manipulating these societies in a different way. Before they manipulated them by supporting extremism through the Saudis, through Turkey and others, that, and now they try to manipulate them by preventing them from having a natural relationship with countries neighboring. So the problem is that the United States behaves like an empire. There is no accountability and therefore it is defeating itself. It is its own worst enemy. So it succeeded in hurting its antagonists or its rivals for decades in our part of the world. And it succeeded in destroying much of our region. But ultimately what it did is it brought down its own empire, at least in this part of the world, by wasting tens of trillions of dollars, by creating anger and hostility among the local populations, by creating mass waves of refugees, and ultimately gaining nothing in return. So unless the American population, the people recognize that this empire is not only wasting its money, but it's acting in contradiction or in conflict with the interests of their own people, but even more important than the American people are Europeans. Because the refugees that uh, sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Marandi, we are not getting you. You're breaking up a lot. So if you if you could, if you please stay and maybe participate as, as you can in the question and answer, that would be great. But I think we should move to the question and answer session. So thank you very much uh, for the effort. Um, I will now, uh, uh, so, so those of you who have questions, please go to the reactions or to the bottom of your screen where there is a raise hand function. It may be either on its own or under reactions. So please go ahead and uh, raise your hand for those of you who have questions or comments. First of all, I, th I, I would observe that at the beginning of the year when Biden became president, he, with, with great fanfare, he announced that America is back and tried to unify, to reunify um, imperialism um, after the destruction of, uh, of Donald Trump. And within six months, what we've seen is, well, we see, we can see what has happened between the United States and France principally, but, but, but you know, you have to say the United States and, and Europe and it's, it, it's um, NATO allies. You have to see um, the failure of, uh, of US policy and uh, their diplomatic mission in Southeast Asia. And I think that, that we have to conclude that, um, as people have said, the, the uh, defeat in Afghanistan has had the effect of exacerbating whatever divisions have taken place. But I think, I, I mean, I, and this has not been, been um, related by any of the uh, presenters, is that the, uh, the, the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan whilst it is, it is a, a very big defeat, and that can be seen by the fall, the, 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 uh, the effect of the fallout within imperialism, um, is that it, it has the character of a, a very uh, highly disordered strategic retreat. And the lesson that I draw from that is that whilst the United States continues to be capable of fighting against multiple 
uh, uh, countries simultaneously, as long as they're small countries. It's now turning its attention to fighting China. And China is not Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria. And so therefore it has to make a withdrawal from these, the, the, these uh, uh, conflicts in order to concentrate its uh, forces on, on, on in the Southeast, uh, uh, in particular in the Straits of Taiwan, the South China Sea and the Malacca Strait. And so I think that that is the process which is going, which is taking place. Um, and I think that the, the other thing that I would want to, to, to raise is that, is why is the United States doing this? Why is there such urgency, uh, and which causes so much damage to their, uh, the, their relations with other imperialist countries? And the, the fact of the matter is that the real turning point, which I, I want to go back to the, the title of the, uh, uh, the event, the real turning point is not the defeat in, in, in Afghanistan, the real, or tipping point, shall I say, because tipping point implies a certain degree of irreversibility. The real tipping point would come when global capitalism is more dependent on China than China is dependent on global capitalism. Because when we cross that tipping point, it would serve no purpose to try to crush China because you would also crush could do great damage to, to global capitalism. And that is what therefore presents the urgency for this. And I think that that is what's created all of the, the divisions which we've seen within imperialism and all the rest of it, because they have withdrawn from, and, and, and this is, this is the, the derangement of the policy. They are simultaneously trying to cross red lines from Russia in terms of Ukraine, Ukraine's membership of NATO and China in terms of the independent recognition of Taiwan. I'm just trying to do that. And we can see that as soon as they take their attention away from Ukraine, they start to fall out with the Europeans. And we'll see if they try to repair that and try to take their attention away from Taiwan, they will fall out with Japan and, 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 and Australia and all the rest of them. So they're in a very precarious position on this. But I think that the urgency is provided by the fact that we're now very quickly approaching to this tipping point that I, I, I mentioned. Thanks, Michael. I, I would just say that actually it's almost as though, yes, you're right, that's probably what's causing the urgency. But then that urgency is urgently closing the door, stable door after the horse has bolted. Because in many ways, divisions within the American ruling class and between America and its allies already show that capitalism is quite dependent on China. Probably the tipping point has passed. I have two other questions and then we will uh, open it. Uh, I will go back to the speakers for responses and then take an, another set of questions. So Fernando, please go ahead. Uh, you are muted. Um, okay. Our, yeah. no. Well, I have a very uh, simple question. Uh, I am not a political scientist, um, but I'm very interested in these events. And of course, I don't have the understanding to some of these issues that you have. And my question is also related to the first speaker and other men mentioned this too, that this uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, and letting the Taliban uh, take over, uh, has an essential um, goal to bring instability in Central Asia. And I would like to know if we could uh, expand a little bit on that. What kind of instability, um, I, I, I suppose one, but anyway, I would like to hear from the speakers. Uh, and, what, um, and what the United States will gain, uh, this is the second part of the question, by creating that instability. Great, thanks, Fernando. And John? I'd just uh, like to raise the question of the role of sanctions in the present situation in Afghanistan. That it's a normal US procedure uh, when their empire suffers a defeat, to then try to inflict such human suffering on the country that has broken free as to provide an object lesson. Do not ever try to gain independence from us. And they've been trying to do this with little success in Cuba for many decades. 
And you know, we, now, we now face the, the fact that the impact of the war has created a, the danger of a humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan, while the United States is simultaneously applying sanctions and the theft of Afghan uh, financial resources internationally in a way that makes it impossible for the new regime in Afghanistan to deal with this. We then question how will it be dealt with? And of course, the, the pressure that this puts on China is, is very obvious. The China cannot stand back and pay no attention to this. It must try to help in some way. And when it does, of course, it will then come under attack and, and be, be come, come under, you know, that, that it will be accused of intervening in turn and a big campaign around it. So I would appreciate comment on this aspect of the situation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, which of the speakers would like to take it first? Um, anyone? Uh, shall I just ask someone, maybe since there was the question of Central Asia, Oleg, would you like to come in and address that? Okay, yeah. Uh, so it's uh, stability versus uh, uh, instability, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's also a kind of uh, playing with terms, yeah. Uh, uh, if I think if we would better speak about uh, geopolitical gains or profits or economical profits uh, uh, in in that sense, because uh, I'm historian, but working many years in international relations, but. Uh, I, I, I quite, uh, I, I couldn't uh, give uh, your, uh, uh, what stability means, in fact, so it's, it's quite a theoretical, quite abstract uh, term, but uh, uh, in, uh, if we um, compare pluses and minuses in geopolitics, so what is the American plus? Uh, because they are not involved uh, uh, now. Sure, there is a uh, very negative uh, PR effect of the fall of Kabul, of the uh, departing planes, uh, people falling from the planes and so on. But uh, 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 it's not uh, uh, their war. It's not in the uh, neighborhood of the United States. And the U.S. can spend 300 million a day for other good things, or maybe for another war, uh, but uh, not uh, so distant from from them. So that's uh, uh, that's the logic uh, uh, we can see in many mainstream media, both in West and in Russia as well, that uh, 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 the Americans uh, haven't lost nothing. Uh, they just free. Uh, they have free hands to to do what whatever they want. And uh, it was uh, Biden, or uh, I, I don't remember, maybe Secretary of State, who said that uh, there is nothing to do for America uh, uh, in Afghanistan. We have uh, Russia and China as our uh, adversaries, so we must concentrate on uh, anti-Russian and anti-Chinese uh, policy. So in that sense, uh, uh, it's quite good. Uh, uh, another point for uh, instability in Central Asia are uh, surely uh, drugs. Because uh, there is uh, and was a huge uh, heroin traffic from uh, Afghanistan. And one of the itineraries was exactly through post-Soviet uh, Central Asia and through Russia to Europe. Uh, uh, in the uh, first uh, Taliban government in Afghanistan in at the end of the 90s, uh, the volume of the heroin traffic uh, was uh, much, much less than it was in the pro-American uh, Afghan governments uh, in these 20 years. Uh, I don't want to blame the Americans uh, to contributing for uh, opium, rise, opium growing in uh, Afghanistan, not at all, but uh, uh, we see the fact. And uh, uh, if the uh, second uh, Taliban government uh, would suppress the 
heroin uh, growing or its substitution within other crops, which is not easy, I understand this as well, uh, 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 it would contribute to stability of Central Asia. Uh, uh, another point from uh, 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 the, Russian, the Russian point of view oh, is uh, uh, the game with uh, gas pipelines, oil pipelines, uh, because Russia is quite sure interested that uh, all the uh, oil and gas from Central Asia pass through the Russian territory. And there were uh, uh, still from the 90s many um, alternative projects. It was a, a kind of uh, project named TAPI, uh, Turkey, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, uh, an alternative uh, gas pipeline. Uh, it was stopped, uh, uh, then the Americans uh, wanted to revive it. Uh, would it be uh, uh, stopped uh, now or with the fear uh, for Taliban, the idea of alternative uh, pipelines from post-Soviet Central Asia to the South? Uh, it would be in favor of Russia. So in that sense, uh, uh, I, I, I would calculate uh, more uh, geopolitical gains, profits, and losses. And in, in, in that sense, the total of this calculation would uh, maybe answer to a question, more stable or less stable will be Central Asia after uh, Taliban. Thanks. There's so many other points that maybe are raised by the questions that, uh, again, I'm afraid I'm going to do a bit of a scattergun thing, but I think it's terribly important to, to stand back and as we talk about global capitalism and the ambitions of the Americans to remember that around the world we're actually facing populist movements uh, in India with Modi, in Bolsonaro, in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines and so forth. Trump, of course, was part of this. Putin is part of this. And this is a, a set of calculations which we don't talk about in terms of what's going to go on in Afghanistan or indeed in Central Asia and so forth. And I think, I think we need to bring that into the conversation. The other thing I thought um, John Riddell's comments absolutely about the financial sanctions, the, the, the punishment, the revenge after losing um, shamefully in Vietnam or with Cuba and so forth is, or Iran, is appalling. But we have to also understand in that dynamic with China, that China also has massive um, racism, Islamophobia in terms of Xinjiang and the labor camps there. So we, we there, there are very, very complicated things that are going on here, as we're all of us trying to, to say. The third point I would like to make, I suppose, is that in these discussions, it is because it's how the media works, as Medea said, and so forth, we end up talking top down because that's who our journalists and, and are, are, are giving voice to and so forth. And I think we lose sight of the point I made about the Taliban as a guerrilla war. These are ordinary people. They're perfectly smart. They can make up their mind what's going to be good for them and so forth. We need also to think about popular movements, for instance, in China. There are an enormous number of strikes that have been going on for years in China. I mean, it's not a, a stable dictatorial state. It is a very complex one with a lot of resistance going on and in other places in the world. So we need to actually put into our calculations, I suppose, some more, more discussion um, in terms of our understanding of global politics, of politics from below. I mean, I know this is what Ajamo and, and Medea are talking about. I would hope I'm talking about that in terms of climate. But we need to also think how we might play that in this much bigger dynamic. Thank you. Um, other speakers would like to take this up? Um, Medea? Ajamo? Uh, no, no, I defer to Medea. Okay. Uh, this issue about the economic warfare that the U.S. and the West uh, is uh, uh, poised to carry out in Afghanistan really brings up the issue about how do we as progressives um, suggest that our governments relate to uh, the Taliban. And as 
secularists that probably most of us are, feminists, um, eh, the Taliban are not our favorite people. Uh, yet we also don't want them to be our enemies. And I think the US pressure to get the IMF to freeze the $450 million that is supposed to go for uh, uh, relief uh, around uh, the, the coronavirus is a terrible thing. And I also think, think the freezing of the $9.5 billion of Afghan central bank money is a terrible thing. Uh, there are a number of women's organizations who are organizing a rally, uh, Don't Forget Afghan Women. And we have been in discussions with them because their number one thing was don't recognize the Taliban. And uh, Code Pink as a women's organization has been trying to get them to take that off and say that we need to recognize who is actually in power. We can't contribute to a, uh, the a suffering that we have already inflicted on the Afghan people uh, by uh, this kind of economic warfare. Uh, and we have been encouraging that the US and, and the Western companies should keep their embassies open in Afghanistan and that we shouldn't be focusing so much on the people who are leaving the country and many of whom, yes, have, have uh, terrible threats against them, but many of them are people like in so many poor countries who want a better life and think of this as their opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, we really have to be focusing on the uh, millions and millions of people who are left behind and in such dire circumstances and economic warfare will only hurt them. That's great. Um, I think, um, Ajamu, you wanted to say something? Well, just very briefly, I, I, I think it's important as we uh, uh, discuss these issues that we, we keep coming back to, and I think Medea touched on this and also Nancy, we keep coming back to a factor that I think is, is fundamental, and that is the, the people, the populations um, in the U.S., in Western Europe in particular that we remember that we have this subjective issue here, this subjective opportunity, if you will, to really uh, hone in on uh, the kind of society and the kind of world that we want to live in. And the sort of general disgust that many people have experienced as they became aware of, of, of Af Afghanistan and the, the uh, loss of life and the resources that have been squandered um, and this feeling the, the, the reality of, 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 of this war, not only in Afghanistan, but this 20 year long so-called war on terror, that is, is providing an opportunity for us to really raise some issues today that we've been raising for quite some time, but the potential response today is much more potentially advantageous for us. So, you know, the first thing we have to do, I think, and the most immediate danger uh, is to try to thwart the anti-China sentiment that's being whipped up by the, uh, the bourgeoisie in, 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 in the U.S. primarily and also with some elements in, in Europe. It, 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 that's important for a number of different reasons, but one of the underlying elements of that that is really, really dangerous is that part of the anti-China sentiment is a, 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 subtle, a subtle appeal, more subtle meaning a lot different than, for example, uh, a Trump's appeal, but a subtle appeal to white supremacy. You know, it, it is racism that is being used as a weapon to generate this anti-China sentiment. And we've got to talk about that as uncomfortable uh, that, that that might be for some people, but that's got to be, we've got to raise that issue again and confront it um, uh, directly, if we're going to be able to try to reverse uh, this drive to war. Related to the, the China situation is people need to know and need to understand what is implied with the completion of this pivot to Asia and the targeting of China, especially as it relates to this insane plan to, uh, to, to, to uh, situate uh, these hypersonic weapons that will completely destabilize the region. 
Uh, and we have opportunities to to raise this issue because people really people really don't understand or don't even know about this. They need to understand what this might mean in terms of of, of global instability and the possibility of a serious uh, mistake happening between China uh, and the U.S. And we connect that to the growing uh, 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 rejection of the use of nuclear weapons. We have a, a, a fantastic instrument, a fantastic uh, weapon with the uh, UN uh, decision to, uh, to uh, uh, make the possession of nuclear weapons an international crime. But who knows about that? We need to raise that uh, and connect that. As flawed as the United Nations may be, I think we as progressives, as anti-imperialists, understanding that that the US and Western Europe um, has decided to basically uh, jettison international law and completely uh, ignore the United Nations Charter, we've got to raise up this issue of international law. We've got to remind people of the, of the constraints and the values reflected in the United Nations Charter. Uh, we've got to raise these kind of issues because the bourgeoisie has decided they're moving away from that. And that's why we have the almost the normalization of rogue statism on the part of both of the US uh, and Western Europe. We've got to raise the issue of NATO and completely oppose any attempts on the part of European powers to establish some kind of independent European army. Who are they going to fight? If not uh, uh, those of us in the global south and the Chinese. So we can't play with this. You know, we've got to bring our analysis down to a level of, 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 of concrete organization. We've got to keep the focus on uh, anti-imperialism uh, and understand that our strategic opportunity has to be to, to have a laser focus on uh, public opinion in the U.S. Uh, and Western Europe, because the global south is clear. Over. Great, thank you, Ajamu. Uh, any other speakers wanted to come in before I go to a next set of questions? Um, I should confess that my um, Zoom is in the process of freezing up again for the third time, but uh, so if I may not be able to see your raised hands and maybe Carlos, you can help me or Paul, you can help me. But I did have Carlos and then I would like to address a couple of points that were raised. So Carlos, please go ahead. Thanks, Radhika, and thanks to all the speakers. Uh, let me just lower my hand. So, yeah, I've just got a question about the geostrategic side of all of this. And, and I think probably from what's been said so far, the speakers have got some, some relatively sharp differences of opinion on this, um, because I think it's important we understand the extent to which the US has, has achieved or not achieved its geostrategic aims of this 20 year war in Afghanistan, or uh, you know, more like a 42 year war in Afghanistan, if we want to take things back to 1979 and, and, and the, the proxy warfare that the US was waging since that time. Um, now, Ajamu and, and Black Alliance for Peace in particular have been very consistent in pointing out that one of the major reasons for this never ending occupation of Afghanistan has been to disrupt the Belt and Road Initiative and to try and protect, to preserve, to extend the, you know, the, the US led imperialist world system as it relates to the Eurasian landmass. In particular, this means extending the China encirclement campaign, which you know, certainly it's got a lot more publicity in recent years with the pivot to Asia starting in 2012. Um, and then obviously this sort of crazed racism and, and aggression of the, of the Trump regime. Um, but which actually, you know, if, if we look back at it, goes, go, goes back to the late 19, 1940s and early 1950s, the victory of the CPC in the Civil War, the Truman administration support for Taiwan, the Korean War, the establishment of the first island chain strategy and so on. So to what extent has the US in leaving Afghanistan been able to protect that overall and overarching strategy. You know, is it the case that this, you know, I think quite surprisingly fast Taliban takeover has affected the US's ability to maintain military bases, to maintain contractors, to maintain advisors and special forces and so on that can do this sort of proxy occupation, you know, quasi-occupation work 
in the absence of an actual occupying army. Um, and, and just quickly connected to that, a few people have commented that leaving Afghanistan forms part of a ramping up of the new Cold War. So you're taking, taking resources away from Afghanistan and pushing them towards the new Cold War, which is directed primarily, uh, but not solely against China, um, which I, you know, I, I think has probably got some merit, but also some contradictions in the sense that doesn't the domination of Central Asia form an important part of a new Cold War strategy? I mean, Afghanistan shares a border, albeit a, a small one, with China. Um, the shortest direct line from China to Iran runs directly east to west through Afghanistan. Um, so if, if the, the speakers could touch on some of those topics, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. That's great. And I think I, had, I saw Suzanne raising her hand. Suzanne, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, this is a fantastic um, uh, webinar. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's really very important to have various views that we can um, uh, discuss and examine. Very important. Thank you so much. Now, there was, uh, there's a lot of things that we could discuss. Uh, one, one of the things is, is in this, in this, um, um, that, uh, in this world of uh, new sanctions, that is sanctions, 39 countries are under sanctions. Uh, this issue of nuclear weapons, uh, the, uh, and uh, everything else, uh, the fact that it's an international uh, threat, um, and we have a job ahead of us, and I know that there are a lot of webinars happening, like, for instance, uh, Code Pink do, doing wonderful webinars, and also anti-war web webinars, and uh, also um, I just saw a couple of webinars on sanctions. These are so important to North American public, Canadian, and uh, I don't know how we can make them more um, uh, accessible to the public that they know about these webinars. They're really uh, revealing and educational and part of our um, uh, hope to build uh, a new anti-war movement, I think. Uh, my question is, somebody spoke, I think it was Nancy, I'm not sure, about the American military budget, that it's increasing enormously. I'm just wondering if the speakers could address themselves to that issue. Who of their, who, I'm talking about the US, uh, uh, who are they uh, funding to implement this new war? It's not just, it's a cold war now, but I think that they're aiming to have more hot wars. It, it's just not clear to us at this time what they're aiming, what their aims are. And so my question again is, please talk about the military budget and what you think they aim to do with that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Suzanne. And I'll just want to uh, add a couple of quick comments. Firstly, Philippe Jandreau wrote something about India in the, in the um, uh, chat. And we were ho ho hoping to have a really good speaker from India, but inexplicably, he has not made it. Uh, M.K. Bhadrakumar, a former diplomat. But nevertheless, let me just say very briefly that I think India finds itself in an extremely big mess right now because it has oriented its foreign policy. Well, it has always been obsessed about Pakistan. And over the last 20 years, it has oriented its foreign policy as a kind of uh, anti-Pakistan strategy and so on. And today, in a certain sense, I think Pakistan has been, has gained from recent developments in Afghanistan. So I think that's uh, a big problem. It has also 
uh, tried to project itself going back to the late 90s, if not earlier, as uh, uh, essentially saying to the Americans, look, we will help you. We will be your counterweight to China, offering the services as counterweight to China. And I think increasingly India's own economic dependence on China is making that difficult. Uh, so I think that all around, I think India needs a massive reorientation of its foreign policy. I'll just say that for now. And I just wanted to say quickly in connection with uh, Ajamu's very good point about the United Nations and so on. The Biden administration has added a new term to the uh, sort of the, the, the vast arsenal of imperialist discourses, you know, democracy promotion and humanitarian intervention and responsibility to protect. The Biden administration has come up with the rules-based international order. The fact of the matter is that we already have in the form of the United Nations, a rules-based international order. So this new rules-based international order of Biden's is supposed to essentially replace that with rules that suit the Americans and suit their allies to a lesser extent and, and so on. So I think that uh, peace movements, generally anti-sanctions movements, et cetera, should really oppose this idea and also support this new organization that has been formed, which at the moment consi consists of all the usual suspects who are opposed to and explicitly opposed to US foreign policy, namely the Chinese, the Russians, the Venezuelans, the Cubans, et cetera, et cetera, Iranians, and so on. They have created a sort of an organization in support of the original principles of the UN Charter. And I think peace movements have to also explicitly support such initiatives as well. So I'll just say that and ask the speakers to please respond to the three questions, a set of remarks and questions that have been raised. So um, anyone would like to um, go first? Oh, you have a question. Can I, why, why don't you play, put your question and then we will uh, uh, do a final round of responses from the speakers. Please go ahead. Sorry for missing you earlier. My the, Zoom is a little frozen. So yeah. Hi, thank you so much. This is incredible to uh, listen to everyone. I'm, I'm a student, so you don't get often much of a chance to listen to wonderful speakers. Um, I have two questions. They, they're probably very, very simple compared to others, but I wanted to know the collective uh, thoughts on, uh, given that most governments will most likely ha create an alliance with the Taliban, for, particularly in the West, for uh, consumption towards the resources that are available elsewhere. So, what are your thoughts on on this particular uh, action of you know of possible uh, alliance between the U.S. government and the Taliban in the future? Um, and my second question uh, is particularly uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Yes. Baraka. Um, uh, I wanted to know, given that a lot of warfare. Um, is based on white imperialism and on white racism. What are your thoughts on how BIPOC uh, community can, within the West, particularly the diaspora, can um, assist those of us within the, the uh, uh, home countries in um, either banishing imperialism, Western imperialism, or... Uh, yeah, I'd like to know your thoughts on how those of us in the West can assist our brothers and sisters within our countries. Uh, thank you very much. Now, before I go to the speakers, may I please request everybody who is not speaking to mute themselves because there is some interference from somebody. I can't locate who it is, but you will be able to tell. So, okay, uh, which of the speakers would like to take up these questions? First, I should say. Radhika, I could jump in first if you don't mind, because I'm, I'm going to have to uh, probably leave. I have a, a car at 11, but I'm going to go past 11. Sure, great. Okay. Uh, two, two things. I want to just comment, and then I come back to the very important uh, last question. I think one thing to, uh, to be right, reminded of, and I think most of us here understand that, understand this, and that is the U.S. is not, is not going to leave Afghanistan. They're not going to leave uh, Central Asia, uh, that um, I think the very important point was raised that a part of, of trying to maintain a commitment to full spectrum dominance uh, requires that they attempt to, to try to exercise hegemony in Central Asia. The form that that might take remains to be seen. We know that there was some discussions um, and a possible strategy um, led by elements inside the CIA 
that one way in which they can make sure that they have a re-entry point into uh, Afghanistan or back into Afghanistan and to continue to uh, make mischief uh, in the region is in, in by supporting uh, uh, the possibility of a civil war in Afghanistan. We know they toy with that, but that is not in place yet. Um, and we know that that's an important, was an important part of their, of their uh, uh, contemplations because uh, back in, in May, um, as they were advising the Biden administration that uh, uh, the Taliban were, were going to, uh, was going to fall, uh, they were already preparing for what they saw as uh, the uh, inevitability of a civil war. And when we see this, when, we, when the CIA talks about preparing, we know what that really means. That means basically creating the conditions uh, for a civil war. So we remember that uh, they uh, went back into Iraq uh, using the same kinds of excuses around uh, destabilization once they uh, helped to empower and expand ISIS. Uh, and so uh, there's a strong possibility of that happening again in this region. And that's why, again, we go back to uh, our only and most important weapon, and that is public opinion. While we have to delegitimize uh, this, the role of the U.S. and Western Europe as the global police people, if you will, that uh, these issues of, of threats to international peace reside with the United Nations, uh, and the framework of legitimation is, in fact, the UN Charter. On the qu uh, question of the uh, issue of, of BIPOC and, 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 and white supremacy, um, we believe that it is vitally important that we address the issue of white supremacy, that we deconstruct its meaning, that we uh, confront uh, the notion of something called the, the West and Westernization, uh, because underlying that concept is uh, a, a normalization of white Western civilizational superiority. We say that has to be delegitimized, that the, that the structural relationship between the emergence of, of the West, uh, this, this, this backwater uh, that, that, that the West was, or the West potentially was in 1492, that came as a, as a consequence of the invasion of the Americas, the enslavement of Africans that provided the material basis for what emerged as the so-called West. So, you know, and we know the contradictions of, 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 of philosophical liberalism and all of the justifications that they have been, they have used to try to uh, prove their civilizational superiority. That has to be debunked, brutally debunked, okay? So what we have to do in all of our respective countries is in fact to do that, to raise these issues uh, in a uh, graphic and dramatic way, uh, no matter how you know, people react to them. But you know, the fate of the entire planet is resting on us being able to delegitimize the justification uh, for these gangsters and criminals to continue to, uh, to wage war on the peoples of this planet. Thanks very much, Ajamu. Um, who would like to go next? Um, thank you. That was wise and terribly important. I would like to come back to say, to emphasize the humiliation, the failure worldwide, both of managing Afghanistan in the long war, but of managing COVID and so forth. The United States is a descending empire. Empires fail, and it looks to me like this is one of them. And I think that with this is important if we understand then the devices that remain to that in that decline. And one of them, of course, is the sanctions. Others of them are this fomenting of civil war, of racisms, which come in many, many varieties. Once you start being racist, there are lots of ways of being racist and it's very ugly wherever it is. I like the idea of Ajamu's making mischief and the instability, because I think that's, in a sense, descending empires have a very short time frame in which they're able to plan. And we all seem to have presumed that the United States um, foreign policy has been very rational, very sane, very coherent, very cogent. And if we've seen nothing else in the last 20 years at least, but 50 years probably, we haven't seen that. It hasn't really worked. And I think 
in that respect, we need to look at the other side of this equation. I deplore, of course, the, the racism against China that's being used in the United States, but we also have to look at their imperial stages. They are an ascendant empire. And in that sense, they've got a much longer term view and the actual possibilities of planning in the long term. And the Belt and Road is 100% about that, for instance. And so we, we need to understand that ascendant empires also divide and rule. And it's a, it's a very complicated thing, but I do think that kind of fulcrum of relative power is part of how we have to understand the strategies that are available to these two imperial forces that are confronting themselves. Great, thank you. Um, any other speakers would like to have a last chance? I'm not able to see who is left. So um, I think, uh, maybe if there is no one, we can bring the meeting to a close. Uh, Alan, you want to say something, but we cannot hear you. I, I don't know if you can see my hand or not. Well, there's just one item which I think is hanging over this whole discussion, and this is imperialism. And um, I think that one of the most important things that we need to develop in order to deal both with the systemic racism of Western civilization that Ajamu referred to, and, and the present condition of the world is the fact that we still live in an imperialist era. And I, I profoundly disagree with Nancy. I mean, it's very good to be in a meeting where one can discuss respectfully with differing views. And this is a discussion that the uh, International Manifesto Group, which has organized this webinar, has, has, has had a number of webinars on, and we'll have to discuss that in future. So I'm not going to return to that. I just want to focus on what is the real legacy of 1492. What 1492 established was a myth mythological situation which disguised the true source of the wealth of the dominant countries. Because it basically, when you look at where does the wealth where does American corporate wealth come from? The, the mythology of the American left is, I'm sad to say, the tradition of the American left, that it comes from the exploitation of American workers. No, it doesn't. It comes from the exploitation of the world's workers, of which American workers are one tenth at most, if that. Therefore, if you wish to defeat American corporate strength, in a European corporate strength, the Canadian corporations, you have to defeat imperialism. And the imperialism you have to defeat is the imperialism of these corporations, not somebody else's imperialism, because that's where the wealth comes from. And that's where the oppression comes from. The means that they use are economic, and what they do with their politics and their military is just keep this economic division of the world in place. And I think the reason that's not seen is the assiduously cultivated myth that somehow America overcame the ancient imperialism of the monarchs of Europe. No, it took them over and placed them in the hands of its corporations and called that peace. It was not a peace. Pax Americana is non-existent. There's not a single year since 1945, when America has not been at war with somebody, okay? And it's been at war for the purpose of maintaining its economic privileges. And the countries that have formed the global North are exactly the same countries that Lenin denounced in 1917 as the robber barons of the world. The only addition is South Korea. There is no other addition. So there's an extremely stable feature of world politics, which is the domination of the world for the maintenance of the relative high wealth and privilege of its corporations, and in order to buy off its working class, of the robber barons of the world. And that's what gives rise to the racism, because people mistake. They think that the reason that they're so rich is because they're superior. No, they're not rich because they're superior. They're rich because they have conquered the world and they maintain the instruments of conquest which keep them wealthy. So the thing that I think that the whole Western or Northern left needs to just absorb is it will never defeat its own capitalists until it's defeated imperialism. And that, that to me is the one most fundamental... 
I mean, if people want to say there's another imperialism coming up, uh, we can have that discussion. It doesn't alter the fact that you must defeat American imperialism, you must defeat Canadian imperialism, you must defeat European imperialism, you must defeat uh, Australian uh, and Japanese imperialism, or you will not defeat your own capitalists. And I think this is absolutely a fundamental lesson that needs to be drawn from the analysis that we've, we've, we've been making. But I think it's been a wonderful meeting and thank you for everybody who's participated and all the speakers. Well, I think on that ringing tone, rallying cry, I think we can bring this meeting to an end. Uh, thanks again to the speakers. Uh, sorry about some of the technical difficulties and we look forward to seeing you again at other events. And um, yeah, thank you very much.